It is Wednesday, 20th of March, 2024. Spring equinox is within view. Beautiful time of the year, time of balance, spring incoming. It's all good. Anyway, this video could be titled, I guess, God 4.0 given that it's the fourth of my major videos examining big questions of theology and the true nature of this reality and what we call God. This one will no doubt trigger a few people, mainly Christians, it has to be said, because the other two did. And Christians seem to get triggered and get offended by anything which challenges their view of things or anything which challenges what is in that book. It's not that I set out to offend anyone. It's not that I set out to specifically trigger Christians. It's just for some reason they feel the need to respond to the questions that I ask and that many other people ask with response videos. That apparently is what Jesus would have done. So when Jesus went into the temple and he saw the money lenders conducting their business, he ran off home and made a YouTube video to denounce them for it. And when Jesus saw a leper in the street, instead of extending a hand of friendship and trying to heal him, he just went off and did a response video denouncing that leper. Apparently, that's the way it works, judging by the reactions I've been getting to previous videos, which at the end of the day are just asking questions. <clears throat> so if anybody's theology or religion or uh, philosophical view on things is watertight and is the absolute truth, it needs no defending. You don't need to get triggered and you don't need to make response videos because it stands up to scrutiny by itself, right? Isn't that the way it's supposed to work? So in this video, I've got some more questions building on the ones that I've asked previously. I don't claim to have the answers to any of it. I'm just at a point where I feel these videos are important to make and they've become the priority in terms of the subjects I wish to explore. And in this one, I specifically want to get into the idea of manifestation. This idea that we can manifest our own experienced physical reality with the consciousness and the intent that we apply to it. So this is something we hear coming out of more New Age inclined spiritual belief systems. It made sense to me for a long time, but it had always occurred to me that this dynamic appears to be flawed. It's not perfect. It comes with terms and conditions and caveats. And so this ties into other big questions. Why would a loving, beneficent God, creator being, who wants the best for us, if that's what we have, gift us with a dynamic which is conditional upon certain things? So, in my simplistic view, something either works or it doesn't. You shouldn't have to jump through a million hoops to get it to work for you. So some people swear by this dynamic of manifestation and they say it's worked for them in their lives. Others can't make it work, want to, but somehow just can't meet the conditions that are required. So again, does it work or doesn't it? Is it valid or isn't it? And if it is, why is it so fucking difficult to harness? Apologies that the video was glitching out a bit there. I've been having quite a few technical problems of late, actually. Specifically, yesterday, my home internet connection went down for no apparent reason. I'm told that it's a major problem with the line, and this happened at a time where I had a whole load of online work that I had to do, specifically connected to my upcoming US speaking tour. With regard to that, I was having major problems selling tickets through Eventbrite. A lot of people were reporting that when it got to the payment stage of trying to order tickets, they were unable to make payment to the point that I had to ditch Eventbrite and go with Ticket Tailor instead, which caused a whole load of admin hassles. I've also had some problems ordering quantities of books, my own books for distributing at upcoming events. So yeah, there's a lot of strange stuff going on. You have to wonder. Anyway, this dynamic of manifestation appears to me to be flawed. And again, the question arises, if we have a creator 
who is omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful, capable of anything, why would this dynamic come with so many flaws and terms and conditions? Why would it not just be made available as a gift to humanity if God is beneficent? So the flaws that I see with it is that those into this idea of manifestation say that you have to ask for something and you have to really, really want it. You can't just ask for it. You've got to want it with all your heart and all your soul. And I've tried this. You know, people say you can write it down, you speak it three times, you just really put that intent out there and really mean it. And I've tried this with many things I've tried to manifest. And it seems to me that some people are able to manifest what they want, or at least they claim that they can, whereas others can't. So what's that all about then? You know, either it works or it doesn't. And people will say, you're asking for it wrong. You're not asking in the right way. And I see that akin to going into Costa and asking for a coffee. And they say, no, not giving it to you. And you say, well, why not? And they say, you didn't ask right. And you say, well, how am I supposed to ask? And they say, ah, oh, well, you know, you've got to figure that out for yourself. When you ask for the coffee in the correct way, we'll serve you the coffee, but not before. You're not asking right. Either it works or it doesn't. Why all the terms and conditions? Why all the uh, caveats? Why are these necessary? Then people will say, you have to cast it out there, what you want to achieve, and trust in the universe, and then just sit tight and wait for it to manifest. And you have no idea if it's going to come in two hours, next Tuesday, or in 20 years. So it's an imprecise science in that regard. Then people will say that you've got to ask for it in the right way in terms of the way you phrase things. So an example that came up in my chat with Dave Murphy recently is if you're someone who doesn't like war, who wants war to stop, if you focus on wanting war to stop, apparently what the universe hears, what creation hears from the intention that you put forward is the word war. And it goes to itself, oh, War, okay, you want more war. Well, here's more war. It doesn't hear that you don't want war. It just notices that you're focusing on the scenario of war, and apparently you empower that. This is how predictive programming works. So if we take all the examples of these movies and these TV shows that depicted events of 9-11, September 11th, 2001, in the years and decades leading up to it, apparently because we were all focusing on these movies, <clears throat> and we were getting images of planes flying into towers and the towers exploding and all this stuff, we were helping to empower that scenario into being, even though it's one that none of us would ever have consciously chosen. We would never have said, oh yeah, I really want planes to fly into these buildings and destroy them and lead to war and uh, all these uh, changes in society which enslave and control us. Nobody would have done that. So the universe has no sense of humour. So if you're having a really bad day and you're really pissed off and you go around saying, uh, oh yeah, this is great. Yeah, I'm having a really good time. Yeah, bring it on. Let's have some more bullshit in my life. Yeah, you might as well just ruin the rest of my day now. The universe hears that and goes, oh, you want the rest of your day ruined? Okay, I'll see to it that you get even more uh, shit in your life. It doesn't see the irony. It doesn't recognise the humour. And so my question is, if you're someone like me who has a pretty dark, twisted sense of humour, you're into cynicism, you're into sarcasm, it's part of your personality, why does the universe or creation or God not recognise that and realise that you don't really mean it? It's just your way of dealing with a bad day by saying, yeah, bring it on. You don't want more of it. You're pissed off that you've had it in the first place. And yet no provision is made for that. There's no sense of humour. Isn't that like AI, robots? That's what they say about these things. They can't perceive humour. They don't recognise these ways that humanity expresses itself through dark humour. Well, then there's no difference between God and an AI bot, is there? If that's the way these dynamics unfold. 
And you often get the opposite of what you ask for. So what's that all about? So with the war example, apparently you're not supposed to focus on I don't want any more war. You're supposed to focus on a utopian world full of peace and love and joy uh, where everyone respects each other and empathy and compassion rule the day. Well then, how many prayers of that nature do you think have been offered up, particularly since 2020? How many people have been praying to whatever God they believe in or just putting their intention out there, speaking it out loud, really, really wanting it like you're supposed to with all your heart and soul? And even those who have believed that there's been some deadly disease out there that's ravaging humanity, their prayers would have consisted of, dear God, please deliver us from this terrible situation. Please return us to a state where none of this is a threat and we can just get on with our lives. And then those of us that have researched the thing and we realise that it's an agenda would have been asking, maybe through meditation or these different forms of expressing, expressing our consciousness, for the evil and the tyranny to be exposed, for the lies and the deceptions that have been spun against all of us to stand fully exposed for all to see, and for the perpetrators of these crimes against humanity, literal genocide, to stand in full justice uh, for what they've done, appropriate consequences to be dished out to them. Has that happened? If it has, I haven't noticed. As far as I'm aware, in Britain, you know, Boris Johnson, Chris Whitty, Matt Hancock, still walking around free men, Patrick Valance, you know, all of them, Bill Gates, uh, Klaus Schwab, you know, Anthony Fauci, all these people walking around free men, no problem, nothing's happened to them. Meanwhile, so many good people who have been opposing the tyranny, who have been opposing the chaos and the violence and what's being done to humanity with deep care within their hearts have suffered so many fates. They've uh, been targeted, they've suffered problems in their personal circumstances, they've lost livelihoods, they've lost relationships, they've suffered uh, with their mental health, with their physical health. So what's that all about? Who manifested that then? Who asked for that? And yet that's what we've got. So you often get the opposite of what you've asked for. So what's the fucking point then? Another example which I gave in a recent interview is we all have nights where we can't sleep. You know, you're lying there, you've got things on your mind, you just can't get to sleep. And maybe you have two or three nights in a row like this to the point that you're absolutely destroyed. And on the third or fourth night, you think, I've got to get to sleep tonight. So you're lying there and you're thinking, oh, I really hope I can get some sleep. I really want to sleep. I just want a good night's sleep. What happens? You can't sleep. You get the opposite of what you've asked for. You get another sleepless night. And people will say, oh, you've got to be careful what you ask for. You've got to ask for it in the right way. And uh, you've, you've got to focus on uh, what you want to achieve. And you've got to imagine that you've already achieved it. So to use the earlier example, if you want a world without war, you're supposed to go around thanking the universe for the fact that you now have a world without war. You're supposed to imagine that all wars have stopped and everyone's living in peace and you say thank you, thank you universe for granting this. It's so wonderful that now we have peace and harmony and joy and love. That doesn't work either though, does it? Because how many people have been wishing and willing this into place and yet it never happens. The only thing that does happen is that evil and darkness and tyranny continues and the suffering of good people and animals, living sentient beings, goes on. So the questions still remain. I'm using manifestation and all these new agey type ideas as a way of reframing these questions. What is this creative force that we have? If it wants the best for us, why do we have to go through so much suffering to achieve it? Why is it necessary to achieve these life lessons in such painful ways? And why are there terms and conditions applied to this dynamic of manifestation if it's the wonderful free gift that we've been given by the Creator? In the interest of fairness and balance, I do want to mention that this past weekend, I was in Scotland and I love being in Scotland. I feel a real 
spiritual connection to that nation. The further north I go, the happier I am. I love going up to the highlands. I always stay north and west. Not so much into the east coast of Scotland. I just love all the highlands and islands and the amazing scenery, the mind-blowing locks and mountains and valleys and just incredible geology of the highlands of Scotland. So this past weekend I was in Glasgow, Dundee and Edinburgh and I did three speaking events there which were really well attended, all three really great, there was a hunger for the information and I was very grateful for the experience. And on the Saturday morning I was fortunate enough to have stayed in the village of Luss on the shores of Loch Lomond. It's an absolutely beautiful village and I went down for a walk along the shores of the loch in the morning and all around me were wild birds in the sky and I could hear the gentle lapping of the water on the side of the loch and I was looking out at the mountains across the way. There were no trails in the sky, the pilots must have had the day off and I was thinking to myself, this is pure beauty, this is heaven on earth, this is absolutely stunning and I was very grateful for the experience and it just brought to mind the beauty and the harmony that there is in nature particularly when you factor in the equinoxes we're very close to the spring equinox now solstices we've got a major eclipse coming up on the 8th of April in the United States and this is all to do with rhythm and cycles and the movements of the luminaries around us and that's a beautiful thing that was obviously set into place by an intelligent force and there's great beauty encoded within it. So here's a conundrum for us, particularly for me. How do you reconcile and equate all this natural beauty and this wonder that there is in this world with all the evil and all the suffering? And again, people will say, well, it's free will choice and it's duality and it's balance. But the beautiful stuff never seems to catch a break. Love and joy and peace and happiness never seems to catch a break. It's always getting its ass kicked by the evil and the darkness. So I'm not denying the presence of an intelligent creator. Obviously not when there's all this natural beauty in the world. But I'm asking how it can allow all these terrible things that go on. People will say it's down to the collective free will choices of the masses. Then where's the provision made for individuals who do take personal responsibility for their consciousness and how they apply it, who don't want all these terrible things happening, who stand opposed to them in very active ways in many cases, who put out information to try and inspire and galvanise and inform others, where's the provision made for them? Because they get thrown in with all the others, you know, the morons, the sleeping, walking dead, the zombies, who don't seem to care about any of this stuff that's going on. And many would argue that they deserve their suffering because they're not taking personal responsibility in any way. But do we deserve to be lumped in with them and share this collective fate with them because it's collective punishment. How does that make any kind of sense? How does that constitute any kind of justice? And what kind of loving being that wants the best for us and wants the advancement of humanity and set all this beautiful stuff in place, all these amazing scenes and, you know, the natural world? Why would it want that? Why are there not better ways of doing things, better systems? You know, something that came up in my talk with Dave Murphy was I was asking why things couldn't be done differently. And he was saying, well, you're coming at it from the consciousness of a human, of a man, and uh, you don't have all the answers. And I was saying, no, I'm saying that if I were God, I'm not claiming that I'm anything close to it. I'm a flawed man. But if I were the creator of everything, anything were possible, I know I would have come up with a system better than this one that didn't have to operate on these terms and these dynamics. So that's what I wanted to address with this video, this whole idea of manifestation, which is very popular within the sort of truth community, the 
conspiracy alternative world, call it what you will. As far as I can see, it's deeply, deeply flawed. And there's not a lot of point in it being there if it only works for some people and not others. And you're told you have to ask for it in the right way. And you try and follow those steps. You try and do what people advise you to do to bring about what you want to achieve. But it doesn't happen. And also, what provision is there for other people in your life that might be causing problems that you're experiencing? So you might be able to manifest changes within yourself and you can ask for your own personal circumstances to improve through your own free will choice. But you can't control others in that way. You can't hijack their free will. And if they're causing problems in your life, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. So, again, what's the point? What's the point of it? If it's all about learning lessons, why do we have to keep learning the same lesson over and over again in very painful ways when we can get it the first time? You know? Some shit comes into your life in terms of your personal circumstances. You can look at it, you can examine it, and you can go, okay, I've got it. Got the lesson. I see what's happening here. I see how maybe I need to change. Uh, I'm going to adapt my behaviours and my thought systems to improve this situation. Got the lesson. Got it. Cheers. Thanks. Can I move on now? No. The same lesson just keeps coming back to beat you over the head again and again and again and again. How many fucking times do you need to learn the same lesson? If you went to school and you went to the same science class 200 times over, wouldn't people be asking by that point why we still have to keep learning this stuff? Because we got it way back. What I want to do here is read out some correspondence from people who've responded to previous videos. So I've been doing this with the last few. I'd just like to share some views from others who have written in. So this is a combination of email messages and comments that have been left below previous videos that I've posted, whether it's YouTube, Odyssey, BitChute or Rumble. So here we go. Random collection of comments. I think they're all valid. I think they all add to the conversation. So the first person wrote in to say, yes, I do think we're made deliberately sensitive and emotionally porous so that our suffering is enhanced. It's what we were saying before about how we're made conscious so that we're aware of our own suffering. Here's the brutal recipe. Design a tender, self-aware, mortal creature with a great capacity to suffer. Place it in a constructed environment of despicable and exquisite evil. Bake on a high heat for all eternity. Bon appetit. Is it the work of AI? What created the AI? Are we a technology? What is nature anyway? Is it a technology too? If God made everything, then he also made nature. It didn't make itself. And as I said before, why make the world so beautiful? Like I was saying about this Scottish lock. Well, if you make it beautiful and then destroy it, the poor sentimental humans experience incredible emotional pain. It's an interesting point. You know, if God were malevolent, were some evil force just consider that possibility for a moment, wouldn't it want to make emotionally sensitive creatures, humans, and place it in this terrible place of pain and suffering so that through our compassion, through our empathy, through our natural inclination towards wanting to do good, we would suffer all the more? I mean, you know, it's just something to consider, isn't it? This goes into the central dynamics of natural law. The non-aggression principle, the self-defense principle, which can be summed up as do no harm but take no shit. So you're not supposed to instigate harm, damage or loss against another living sentient being. However, that dynamic changes when an immediate threat is posed to you by another individual or group of individuals. So if they're trying to harm you or harm people that you care for, 
you then take on the right to do whatever is required to put that threat down, up to and including the use of deadly force. So if you kill somebody who's trying to kill you, that's not instigating harm. That's self-defence. And you have a right and a duty to self-defence. So what this person is asking is whether it's justifiable to want to do harm to those who have caused the agendas of the past few years, the Convid agenda and the Armed Spear agenda, all of which were designed to bring great harm to millions or billions of people. So they say, would I be doing good by destroying psychopaths? And at the same time, would I be doing bad by harming others, though maybe not being punished for it? Well, that's really testing natural law, isn't it? And it's another question. Natural law is clearly a very real thing, but I always assumed that it included consequentialism and karmic payback justice. But as I mentioned earlier in this video, karmic payback and justice doesn't really seem to be in great abundance in these times. So is that dynamic as sound? as I've assumed it to be for many years. Where's the justice would be the overriding question. Somebody else writes, I recently had the misfortune of seeing a video clip of a monitor lizard move in and eat a poorly goat it had been pursuing for who knows how long. I found it so shocking and dark that it kept me awake that night and stayed on my mind for days after. It got me thinking about what in the name of anything could have come up with this cold and calculated creature if creation is such a thing, and I began to wonder whether nature had been hijacked in some way. This is another big question. Perhaps what we're looking at here is the hijacking of original creation put into place by the Most High, the original God, by some evil demonic force. But then, as I've mentioned in previous videos, an even bigger question then arises. If this place has been hijacked, and if it is some sort of simulation or some sort of uh, horrific version of what was there before, how did the original God of creation, all-seeing, remember, all-knowing, all-powerful, capable of anything, how did this God allow its beautiful creation to be taken in this way when it could have stopped it? when it could have put down this demonic force? Big questions. Kind of goes on to the next one. Somebody had listened to my conversation with Eric Dubay, which was great. Did that recently. We really got into some heavy subjects in that one. Everything I've heard from you or Eric has stated that there is one source, one creator, just one, and he created everything. What if there were two? What if the lie was that God created the devil? What if he didn't? What if there are two sources, so to speak, of fairly equal measure battling for this construct like a game of chess? Imagine if yourself and someone who, let's say, was at the soci sociopathic end of the scale, made a simulation. How would that end up looking or maybe the sadistic part started to make the simulation, and you were then forced to code against it to play the game. Each only able to add to the code in equal measure, neither able to remove any, like a game of chess. There are both sides in every part of nature and the construct we're living in. If the truth was... If the truth was to be that there were two creators of opposite measure battling for this construct, then maybe a few of your questions would be answered. So I think the idea there is that our concepts of God and Satan might be the same. Maybe it's uh, one entity expressing itself in these two ways in the interest of duality. So God and Satan are battling it out in this realm. But again, my question would be, if the original creator of all things were good and beneficent, why would it allow this? Why would any of this be necessary? 
were there not better ways to have constructed everything? On to the next one. Most people, it seems, have little or no recollection of previous lives. Some may relate to the romantic idea of being someone famous from the so-called historical records. Others may reveal some underlying personage when under hypnosis. Also, there is substantial evidence of children speaking of events that they were not actually born yet to experience. This phenomenon is well documented by a scientist, Dr. Ian Stevenson, who was of course derided and excluded from the establishment. His research in the book Old Souls, written by a journalist, uh, recounts many such incidences in children in Lebanon and India, areas where reincarnation is taken as normal. What hit me was that most of the children who were relating past lives were of people who had died in painful circumstances, such as in a car accident or on the operating table, as if their minds were not able to be wiped clean or reassimilated for what comes next. Who in their right mind would agree to experience this realm, where SRA, mind control from birth, MK Ultra and Bernaysian propaganda have ruled for centuries. So maybe the mind wipe actually hides the abuse we have suffered in previous lives, only to enter another body that has yet to suffer more abuse. That is not the kind of thing a beneficent, kindly creator should wish on anybody that lives their life observing cosmic law, do unto others, and who intuitively knows right from wrong. Exactly. This is one of my contentions as well. Where is the provision for those of us who attempt to live our lives the best we can according to natural law principles? We do no harm to others. We stand opposed to evil and tyranny wherever we see it. And yet we get lumped in with the collective punishment that everybody else receives. So where's the incentive for us to try to do good and observe morality and be the best we can if all that happens is we keep getting plunged into life after life after life where we have to undergo suffering? Who would devise a system like that? Next comment. I'm wondering if because one is genuinely awake, one is being dealt karma in this life rather than in some form of afterlife or future life. I'm acutely aware of my own past failings and misdemeanours, right down to my thoughts at times, which I know others around me do not think or experience to anything like the same degree. Just getting my head round what I mean by that, because obviously I'm not a New Age karma follower either. And the final comment I'll read out, I think you would be interested in listening to some perspectives by the following people. Darius J. Wright. He's able to leave this construct at will through a certain practice. I can do this, but not at will. Too scared, if I'm honest, but damn, it's an incredible experience. I think you would at least enjoy learning about this. Also, Aaron Abke, previously a Christian pastor, but who left due to too many unanswered questions. You two would have a great conversation together. Also, have you listened to Conversations with God? I personally really resonate with this, and that's by Neil Donald Walsh. So there are some shows that I want to do to discuss some of these matters further. I'm trying to get Mark from the Forever Conscious Research channel on. I think that would be a great chat. Also, I would like to get hold of Howdy Mikowski, if I can. If anyone knows how to reach out to that dude, if you've got an email address for him, please drop me a message with it. I've had conversations with Eric Dubay. I had one with Dave Murphy, 
allegedly Dave. And I did a great one recently with Alan of Salisbury, who was talking about the occult art of law and word magic, the casting of spells through literally spelling words. So I'll be dropping that one very soon. Other matters that I want to discuss, just some upcoming events. As I say, I had an awesome weekend in Scotland. Just want to thank everyone that came out for some great events there. I've got my walking tour of Oxford coming up this Friday evening at 6pm. That's 22nd of March, 322. It's an important date in the occult calendar. I'm not a dark occultist. I'm not a Satanist. I do these events on these dates to try and overwrite and dissipate some of the dark energy that's put out on them. It is, of course, the spring equinox, and it's a wonderful time of year. So that is touring many of the spots in Oxford city centre, where aspects of the narrative of my two novels, The Cause and the Cure and The Gift and the Curse, take place. Still a few places available on that. Links below uh, to where you can get involved in it if you wish to be a, ta a part of that walking tour. Ben Emlyn Jones from Oxford will be joining me to add some of his own insights. I've then got one more UK event before I break out to America. And that event is taking place in Ferndown, just outside Bournemouth, in a hotel venue. That's Tuesday, the 26th of March, and that is my culture creation presentation. There's links below to where you can get involved in that event if you want to come along and hear me talk about my core subjects, what I mainly get into. The manipulation of the collective human mindset through popular culture, entertainment, and music. So that's Ferndown, Bournemouth, Tuesday 26th of March. After that, it's all about my US mini speaking tour on the American East Coast. So there's four events there. Anyone listening in America, close to these cities, if you want to get along and listen to my musics, military and mind control connections presentation, please get yourself an advance ticket to these events. They can only take place if enough advance ticket sales are made because there are costs involved in putting these events on and if enough tickets aren't sold, quite simply, they can't take place. So if you're thinking of going, uh, if you can make it to these events, please get the tickets in advance and help me to make these events a reality. There will be a provision to roll up and pay cash on the door, but the preferred thing, which really helps me out with the planning, because I'm doing all this myself and having to make financial outlays to make these events happen, is to buy the tickets in advance from Ticket Taylor. If you know anyone near these cities that you think might be interested in getting along, please help me out by spreading the word. So the first event is Wednesday the 3rd of April in Boston at the Union Tavern, Somerville, in that district of Boston. That's 7 to 10 p.m. Each of these events lasts about three hours. It's me speaking in two parts, with a small break in the middle, and then an audience Q&A and book signing at the end. So that's the first event, Wednesday, 3rd of April, Boston. Then it's on to Philadelphia, Saturday, 6th of April. I'm going to be at the Misconduct Tavern in Philly, and that's taking place from 6 to 9 p.m. The following day, New York City, the Town School, Manhattan, 76th Street. This is an afternoon event from 2 to 5 p.m. Don't come in the evening because you'll miss it. Daytime. And the final event is Wednesday, the 10th of April in New Haven, Connecticut, right in the belly of the beast, close to Yale, and Skull and Bones, where so much of the skullduggery goes on. So I like the idea of bringing some light and some positivity and empowerment to that particular area. That's in Bar, New Haven, and that one is 7 to 10 p.m. So four events, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, New Haven. If you can make it to any, or you know anyone that can, please spread the word and get booking on the links below. There's also a crowdfunder, which I'm running to try and meet some of the cost of putting these events on. So if anyone feels to contribute to that, these are voluntary donations, no pressure, of course, but anyone that's found value in my work and would like to see these American events happen and help me to meet some of these operating costs, then you can contribute to the crowdfunder in the link below. 
Everything else is at my main website, djmarkdevlin.com. Looking forward to some more conversations as the year progresses on subjects of this nature, as we try and come up with some of the answers together and ask the questions together, because ultimately that's all we're doing. So hope to see you again soon. Hope to see many Americans at these events and I'll catch you next time. Cheers.